themselves. I'd like to come back to some of that. Now, Jean-Pierre. Well, uh, thank you. Uh, as a Frenchman based in Asia for many years, my view may be a bit uh, biased because I'm more sensitive to the uh, rise of China, to its uh, growing assertiveness in the region than if I were based in Paris or, or in, uh, elsewhere in Europe, where, of course, the Ukraine war, the Middle East and Africa are much more, um, much more pressing issues than what's going on in the Far East, what we used to call the Far East in Europe, which is uh, the Indo-Pacific region. Um, I have to say, I mean, th the short answer to your question, uh, Doug, is that um, I think the US has been and will remain more successful uh, in the global north and in the global south in uh, aligning um, its uh, allies and partners uh, with it on China and uh, the growing tension in, the, uh, uh, in East Asia. Um, uh, John mentioned, and I basically agree with him, that uh, NATO is a big factor of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, bringing together the Europeans and the, and the Amer no, Americans and the Canadians. Um, on an on, on issue like China. I mean, the fact that China now is one of the issues uh, discussed in NATO is an important uh, move in the direction of a more, coordinate, more transatlantic coordination on East Asia and China. So that's the thing which uh, I think we can't, we can't ignore. Uh, another trend which has taken place even before this uh, recent tension in the Taiwan Strait for some years is the fact that the European Union itself has moved away from a full kind of naive engagement with China <coughs> to a much more balanced uh, China policy. You know, we, we, we know the three pillars of this policy now. One is co economic cooperation, the other one is economic competition, and the third one, uh, which is something which has shocked the Chinese uh, when it appeared in 2019, was the idea of uh, we are in a systemic rivalry with China. So China is a systemic rival, whatever it means. It means that we don't share the same political values, that we don't see the international order the same way, uh, we don't abide to by, by international law the same, uh, in the same manner, in particular, the, for, for instance, as far as the, the law of the sea is concerned and many other aspects of international law. So I, I think here, uh, in other words, China's growing power has brought together more than before uh, the Europeans and the Americans on, on, on China. Now, it doesn't mean there are no differences. There are quite a number of frictions, which we mentioned earlier today, uh, like, uh, you know, the, 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 the trade war and, the, uh, and how, how much uh, sh shall, we, shall we put sanctions on China, not only for uh, human rights in infringements, like the question of Xinjiang, which uh, on, on the Xinjiang issue, I mean, uh, that was two years ago for the first time, the Europeans the, with the Americans, the U British and the Canadians decided to impose sanctions on some officials in Xinjiang. And that's what, um, for the European point of view and the European Union point of view, that was unprecedented. So those are changes which are, tend to bridge the gap between the, uh, the Europeans and, and, and the Americans on, Southeast uh, on, on China. Now, if we look at East Asia, I think you mentioned Southeast Asia, which is, uh, yes, of course, in a very difficult position. Uh, but just a word about Southeast Asia is that, uh, of course, they, they, they can't um, uh, publicly and openly criticize China, but they're very happy to have the U.S. around and to, to keep the U.S. around, uh, all the way from the Vietnamese, of course, uh, which have been in, uh, in, you know, in a difficult position for 1,000 years with the Chinese, but also with countries like Singapore, which are, are very happy to have the Americans <coughs> in Tongi and, and uh, in the Malacca Strait as well. So, uh, but, and, and in addition to those countries, of course, you have countries in East Asia like Japan, and, and, and we're going to talk about in, in, in South Korea, which are also uh, U.S. allies. And these uh, U.S. alliances in the uh, Indo-Pacific region have uh, remained a, a factor of uh, alignment with the U.S. <coughs> position in uh, uh, regarding China. Uh, now, of course, the, the burning issue, I mean, we, we may come back to that later, but it's a Taiwan issue. And I have to say what has triggered the growing tensions in, in the Taiwan Strait has been um, the, uh, not only China's uh, clear assertiveness, but also is, is more obvious haste to unify mm. China, Taiwan with China. And that has been, to me, a major destabilizing factor in the region because most of the countries in the region are attached to the status quo in the Taiwan Strait. And for the first time since, well, I mean, it started actually 10 years ago, more or less, more or less in 2013, when, when, when Xi Jinping decided that we can't leave this, generation, this question unsolved and, and transmitted from one generation to another. So now we uh, clearly, uh, uh, the, uh, 
uh, China's policy towards Taiwan has, we, has been to mix more, uh, much more carrot and stick and to use much more coercion against Taiwan in order to try to convince Taiwan to, to unify with China. But the, the problem with the, this policy has badly backfired and actually uh, rally a number of countries which were not that close to uh, the U.S. To, to, the, to, to the U.S. and to uh, support of uh, the status quo in, in the Taiwan Strait. So that, now, we may come back later to the yeah. comparison between <coughs> Ukraine and, 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 and Taiwan. I would just say a word about the Global South, because uh, I've, in the last 10 years I've worked quite a lot on China-Africa relations. I've done a quite a number of field works in Africa. And clearly the Africans don't want to choo choose between the U.S. and China. But one thing I will remind everyone, I mean, for the one coming from Africa, they're very familiar with, with Afrobarometer, is that both China and the U.S. are pretty popular in Africa in terms of... Uh, 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 you know, favorable views, uh, they are more or less at the same level. 60% of the Africans are favorable of China, but there's also 58% of the Africans that are favorable, favorable view of the U.S., much more than the, uh, uh, the, the, of, uh, the, the, their view of, the, you know, much more positive view than their view of the former colonial powers. So, so uh, and they clearly they don't want to choose. They see, uh, even today, I think most uh, countries in the South, they, they think they can get away with this uh, new so-called Cold War between the U.S. and China and remain neutral and still benefit from cooperating with both sides. The problem with the, you know, talk about Africa is the, f the fact that the U.S. is much less present in Africa and that the, uh, the American uh, diplomacy has deserted Africa. And that's been, uh, I think, a big, a big, a very, uh, a big weak point of the, of the, of the Americans. In, in that continent, and, and that's uh, opened the way, opened a boulevard actually to China, uh, to becoming much more uh, active from a diplomatic point of view, military point of view, but also uh, with the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, economic point of view. So that's where we are now. Well, thank you very much, Jean Pierre. As a parent of diplomats who are uh, self professed Africanists, I recognize your last remark very clearly. <laughs>